Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the webinar of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Today's webinar is the module two of the respiratory physiology. Module one we have done last month, and today is the module two being discussed. And the module three will be on 21st of October. And before we start the webinar, I have certain important announcements. Indian College of Anesthesiologists will be conducting our annual conference this year as a virtual conference, probably on the last Friday and Saturday of December. And the conference will be a from New Delhi. The conference chairperson is Dr. Belji Singh, who is our CEO. And the conference time is put our most flexible timing that is going to be a day and night show. That means we will be starting at three in the evening and we're ending around 8, 30, 9 in the night. That means we will be putting it as a day and night on two consecutive days on the Friday and Saturday of the last week of December. This is one information. And more information soon you will be getting from Dr. Belgi Singh. And the next webinar on 7th of October will be from National Hirudayale at Bangalore. And they will be doing the webinar on cerebral monitoring. And this monitoring webinar will be an all India webinar because all the faculties from different parts of India are joining and is partially sponsored and supported by Meditronics India. Chairpersons of the day for the webinar to, to open up are Dr. Raminder Sagal and Dr. Vijesh Venagobal, whom we have met last time. Dr. Raminder Sagal, I believe her internet is down she may not be able to participate sometimes. Anyway, I will make a try. Dr. Reminder, are you anywhere here? Are you anywhere in the vicinity? Dr. Radhakrishnan, I think the internet connection where she is right now, Jammu, is very poor. So she had already said she may not be able to. Okay, okay. That, uh, I accept. In that case, we too will chair in her place. And the other co-chair is Dr. Vijesh Venugobal from Calicut, whom we met last time. And today's topic is on respective physiology module two. And the speakers are Dr. Well. Pangaj Kundra and Dr. Shofa Philip. I take the pressure of introducing Dr. Pangaj Kundra. Pangaj Kundra is known to you all well a senior academician, a senior teacher, and a senior professor who is currently engaged with Jipmir Pondicherry. He is a researcher and a mentor of many of our colleagues. He has helped to gain heights with many persons in their career. And he has many publications, textbooks, short literature supplements to his credit. And he is the current dean at Jipmir Pondicherry. As you know, Pangaj is a known national and international speaker. And I may put him in only one sentence. He is a teacher of teachers. I have really pleasure introducing Pangaj you to this crowd and you are requested to enlighten all with your knowledge on the oxygen and carbon dioxide transport, which an average anesthesiologist in this country should know of. Over to you, Pangaj. Good evening, sir. And uh, I'm really humbled by your work. This is coming from you. Uh, 
thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. I do not know whether I'm worth it, but thanks a lot. I'll just go to my screen sharing now. Are you able to see the screen? Yeah, fine, sir. You can go ahead. Uh, good evening to all of you for sparing, and thank you for sparing your evening for this webinar. This is one of the topics which uh, we will be uh, dealing with day in and day out, whether we are students, whether we are residents, whether we are faculty, whether we are practicing clinicians. This is never going to leave us. And there is a lot of physiology attached to this. I may exceed my time, so please excuse me for that. This topic was given to me by the ICA, and I thank them to give me this kind of topic, which involves a lot of physiology. So to begin with, when we talk about oxygen transport, it basically involves the journey of oxygen. When we take it into our alveoli, into our lungs, and then it goes to the mitochondrial level. And this is well described by an oxygen cascade. So the oxygen cascade, which all of you would have seen, appears something like this. So from room air, if we look at the room air part, you'll find that there is the, the PO2 is around about 159. As it comes to the inspired air, it drops to 149. Alveolar air, it comes to 100. Pulmonary capillaries, 99, and so on and so forth. And then it begins to rise up after it has to come back to the alveolar. So this is what actually happens. All these numbers which are created are because of a physiological response. And we will be dealing each one of them as we go across with this lecture. So this is what is the inspired air, which comes from the inspiration that we've taken, and it goes down to the mitochondria. And this is the ox expired oxygen when there is a step ladder fashion, when we expire out some amount of oxygen, which is left over and carried to the lungs. Now, how does this happen? Let's consider the atmospheric to the alveoli transfer first. If we are at sea level, the barometric pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. Water vapor pressure is this much, and the inspired concentration is 21%. Now, how do we convert it to the Just multiply it with the atmospheric or the barometric pressure minus the water vapor pressure, and this is what we get. So that's the partial pressure of oxygen we breathe in from the atmosphere. Now, what are the factors which are influencing this partial pressure? It is the FiO2, the inspired oxygen concentration, and the barometric pressure. Now, let me take you, let me take you to another area. That is the summit of the Mount Everest. If you go there, the barometric pressure drops to about 253 millimeters of mercury. Water pressure, water vapor pressure is the same. And the inspired oxygen concentration remains the same. We always tell us there is deficiency, but it is not the case. The concentration of the oxygen, which is 21%, would remain the same whether you are at sea level or whether you are at Mount Everest. The only thing that changes is the partial pressure. So the partial pressure, which was 159 at the sea level, at the summit of the summit of the mountain, it comes down to 52 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you happen to take an arterial blood gas a person at that particular area or at the summit of the Mount Everest, who is acclimatized, just remember this word, acclimatized. What happens? The pH is alkalotic, 
look at the pco2 it is much below normal but what is startling is the pao2 is just 29.5 mm and the alveolar oxygen tension is 32.4 so if you have a person with 29 or 30 mm of pao2 you will just be wondering whether we are do the alveolar what happens to hemoglobin that's the one parameter which compensates with acclimatization and that's how the oxygen content is maintained and tissue oxygen continues so this is what we need to remember that the partial pressure of oxygen plays an important role as far as the saturation and oxygen content which is later on we will talk about is to be maintained now what is the effect of fio as an anesthetist that we do denitrogenation which was called earlier as pre oxygenation and when we increase the fio2 the nitrogen content only falls but there is no change in co2 levels and if we increase the fio2 to 40% through face mask you have given it to some person the nitrogen content will come down to 60% but the co2 production remains unaltered and if you happen to give 100% to these patients there will be absorption atelectasis because nitrogen is the one which keeps these alveoli inflated so once the nitrogen is is taken up by oxygen and the oxygen diffuses across into the ca capillaries there is nothing left in the alveoli and they tend to collapse that is the reason the safe limit of giving an fio2 is about 0.8 or 8. and now if you covid i think we should always remember this if you attempt to increase your fio2 beyond 80% whether on non rebreathing face mask whether on niv or on ventilation you are going to do more harm some sort of absorption atelectasis and it will be very difficult to recruit these alveoli now to come to what is the role of these partial pressures we are talking about so that brings us to the dalton's law dalton law states that the total pressure of the gas mixture is the sum of the pressures of each gas if they exist on their own what does it mean it means if you are giving 67% of nitrous oxide and 33% of oxygen the partial pressure exerted by Will be five zero nine by one, but the total amount of pressure which is existed is is exerted will always be seven sixty millimeters of mercury. The same analogy, if you apply to the inhaled air, air alveolar air, the exhaled air, you will find that whatever proportions change, but the total pressure would always be seven sixty. So this is what is dalton's law and its application to remember how the proportions of the gases can change in a mixture but they will always keep the pressure constant or the total pressure would always be the same that is 760 now let's talk about the oxygen uptake from the alveolus now this happens by a process called diffusion if you look at this point you will find that the alveolar is 104 but what is into the capillaries from the pulp so there is a big gradient that is a partial pressure gradient exists and because of this gradient as the uh, rbcs traverse through this area they get oxygenated and at the end of the journey they are fully oxygenated or equilibrated to the alveolar oxygen tension So this is what we see in the graph here the blood po2 once it is saturated it plateaus out and by circulation it reaches the uh, the other organs the same thing happens with the alveolar initially it is high about 45 and the alveolar co2 is 40 so there is always a diffusion from the capillaries to the alveoli and then through alveolar ventilation the co2 is washed away 
So this is a process of diffusion which occurs. It's not that simple. Now in the alveolar air, there will be a mixture of inspired oxygen as well as expired oxygen. Both of them. So what we have seen now is this part. That is FiO2 and barometric pressure. But when we come to the alveolar level, when we talk about expired oxygen and CO2 levels, you will find we'll have to talk about CO2 or the partial pressures of oxygen and the respiratory portion. So that has to be minus if you need to know the expired oxygen concentration as well. So if the PaO2 is there or the alveolar oxygen, if you substitute the value 760 for barometric, water vapor pressure is 47, respiratory quotient is 0.8, then you'll get a value of 100 millimeters of mercury. So this is what is coming out into the alveoli and the respiratory quotient and the PCO2 is what is coming out of the alveoli. And that is what will be the alveolar oxygen. Now, our alveolar ventilation is about four liters. That means the alveolar oxygen per minute would be the concentration of the oxygen in the small atmospheric air in 840 ml. We all know that the oxygen uptake is about 240 ml per minute at rest. So the total alveolar oxygen content per minute would be about 600 ml. Now, why do we need to know this? We need to know this to the expired alveolar concentration. So the alveolar content divided by the capacity which we have, we get about 15%. And this 15%, if you minus 6%, you will get you will get about, I mean, you will get about 15% because 6% is taken away by the CO2. So that's the expired alveolar concentration. Now, what do we deduce from this? We deduce that an increase in FiO2 will increase the PaO2 because it is going to encroach upon the nitrogen content. But if there is an increase in PaSO2, it will decrease the PaO2 and it is going to encroach upon PaO2. So this is the deduction which we normally get from your alveolar inspired and expired concentration. So remember, it is the PaO2 which will encroach on the nitrogen, but it is the CO2 which will encroach upon the oxygen reserves. So this implies to the COPD patients where you have higher CO2s, and you find that the oxygen concentration drops. Now let's see how what happens when the, when the gas or the air has to go from alveoli to lung capillaries. This is followed by what is called as Fick's law of diffusion. Whenever we talk about diffusion in cardiorespiratory physiology, it basically implies to Fick's law of diffusion. So this is an arterial end that is coming from the pulmonary artery or the right ventricle. And this is the venous end that is the pulmonary veins draining into the right atrium. This is the capillary. Now, why do we have to take this figure? Now the alveolar hemoglobin distance is about 0.5 to one micro, micrometers. That's the distance which is there between the alveolus and the lung capillary. Now, these RBCs have to traverse through this aerating zone of about 600 to 800 micro, microns. So that's the distance which they have to travel. And the distance between the alveolus and the capillary is about one micron. Now, what happens is that if there is, if the total time taken is about 750 milliseconds for the RBCs to go from this point to this point to traverse this 600 to 800 micrometers distance. Now what happens is, if this alveolar hemoglobin distance increases, then there will be less oxygenation. And also if the time taken of the RBCs is fast, it travels faster through the zones, they will never be fully saturated with oxygen when they leave the aerating zone of the capillary, of the, of the alveoli. 
so that's the thing which we must remember when we talk about these factors how the diffusion occurs so this distance if you see is likely to increase if there is interstitial edema if there is collapse of the alveoli or the alveoli are filled with some sort of fluid right so that is what will happen if you if uh, if this distance or the if distance is increased what about the traversing time if there is a very high cardiac output and the rbcs do not get time to get aerated by the time they travel then the oxygenation would suffer and that is what you can see in this graph the minimum time you need is about 0.25 seconds or 250 milliseconds for it to get fully saturated so 0.25 milliseconds to uh, uh, i mean 250 milliseconds to 750 milliseconds is fine but in any case if it falls below this then the po2 levels will not equilibrate and there will be some sort of fall in the oxygen and uh, i mean uh, the oxygen uh, partial pressures in the alveoli so just remember this now the same thing when we apply to the uh, apply to the tissue levels let's go to the tissue so these are the rbcs which are going this is the po2 which is going you see as the rbcs go across the po2 falls and you see the tissues this is the intracellular uh, po2 at a cell which is far away from the hemoglo from the rbcs or the capillaries but a cell which is nearer to the capillaries you will find the po2 is higher going to the mitochondrial levels also the mitochondrial po2 is higher at this level as compared to this level which is farther away from the capillary which means that if there is a increased distance and if the gradient is less the diffusion is going to be slow so there is going to be a slow diffusion if there is a long diffusion distance and there is a low pressure gradient but there is going to be a rapid diffusion if there is a short distance and high pressure gradient so what does this tell us it takes us to the fix or the rate of diffusion by the fix law of diffusion that's the first law and it's it's very easy to understand here d means the diffusion constant which depends upon the capillary permeability for a specified gas at a specified temperature a is the alveolar surface area c1 c2 you can substitute it to p1 p2 that is the partial pressure gradient between what we have already talked about across the membrane and t is the capillary thickness we talked about the alveolar hemoglobin distance that is what t means but the diffusion constant which we have here is dependent upon the gas solubility and its molecular weight so this is in short the fuchs law of diffusion and if you collaborate the figures which i showed you earlier you will be able to understand how does it how does it collaborate with the diffusion of the gases so it is inversely i mean it's inversely proportional to basically the thickness so more the thickness lesser the diffusion more the gradient better the diffusion so just remember this that's the fix law of diffusion it or it also applies at the capillary level we'll come to that later when we reach there now we come to another important part the oxygen has diffused across into the arteries sorry into the pulmonary veins or the capillaries but there is always a gradient a gradient which is which is actually altered by fio2 and h this is the, these are the two factors which can determine or alter the normal alveolar arterial gradient and this has to be taken into account so if there is hypoxia if you need to differentiate whether it is because of hypoventilation lung diffusion problems or both you will have to consider two items what is the a by a ratios and what is the pco2 levels so if you look at the a by a ratios in hypoventilation it will be normal but if there is a problem with lung diffusion if the thickness is altered that there will be a high gradient and it also will be high if both hypoventilation and lung diffusions are are i mean abnormalities are present pco2 will be high in hypoventilation 
it will be high in both but it will be low in lung diffusion so just take into this account that if there is a diffusion problem then the a by a normally increases and the pco2 falls because these gases are not able to diffuse across the the membrane the other thing we come to know about this is about the a by a gradient is when we talk about the venous admixture we know there are three type of shunts the anatomical shunts which are extra alveolar there are physiological shunts which happen because of vq mismatch and there is a diffusion limitation so at the bedside is it possible for us to calculate the shunt fraction without going into too many calculations a simple way is to take the pressure gradient between the alveolus and the arterial divided by 20 but before that you keep the patient on 100% oxygen for 15 minutes thereby the a by a will only be contributed by the shunt and not by the inspired oxygen i mean not by the alveolar a so that is what we need to remember give patient about 10 to uh, 10 to 15 minutes 100% oxygen calculate the a by a and divided by 20 and you will get the shunt fraction so this is a simple way of calculating the uh, i mean shunt fraction and it is should be less than 10% if it is more than 10 to it more than 10% going up to 15 16 you can correct it by fio2 by, uh, by increasing the fio2 but if it goes beyond 20% then the patients require other maneuvers and you have to think of other things because it will not further be corrected by increasing the fio this is the other shunt fraction which we all talk about so pulmonary shunt fraction is generally taken by the pulmonary capillary con oxygen content which is uh, you subtract the arterial oxygen content divided by the uh, uh, the difference between pulmonary capillary content and mixed venous and that is what you will get the fraction here so i am not going to into those those details these are formulas which you can do but the easiest one at bed side which you can do which i have already told you a by a divided by 20 after giving 100% oxygen for 10 minutes and you get the shunt fraction now let's go to the other part that is blood to tissues how does the oxygen go from here from the blood to the tissues the most important part is the oxygen content now if you look at the oxygen content there are two factors which we need to consider one is the partial pressure of oxygen and then the oxygen content what is the relevance of the two partial pressure of oxygen is the rate and extent of gas transfer okay so that's the pressure gradient which allows the gas to go in from one compartment to the other the rate and to extent which is it, which it is transferred from the alveoli into the capillaries and then from capillaries into the tissues so that's where the partial pressure is important we have we have already seen that and we have seen that in the fixed principle now what about oxygen content this is important for cellular function like i showed you the blood gases at the summit of mount everest and i called upon you to to say that it is because of acclimatization now the blood gases i showed you that depicted an arterial content of oxygen content of almost 18.5 ml normal is about 20 ml so it is within normal limits now if i have to substitute the values the hemoglobin was 20.2 if you remember saturation was just 68% and the po2 if you remember it was just 29.5 and this is the physical solubility of oxygen so when you do this calculate this you will get an arterial content of 18.48 ml so what we need to know is for the oxygenation to happen the oxygen content is more important than the partial pressures but yes partial pressures have a role to play to increase the oxygen content if the partial pressures were low the oxygen content would never improve until unless the patient is acclimatized by increasing the hemoglobin as has happened at this summit of mount everest so let's talk about these two factors what is the influence of partial pressure of oxygen 
So the partial pressure of oxygen is responsible for how much oxygen is transferred into the circulation, which can then bind to the hemoglobin. It is also responsible for dissolved oxygen, but that fraction is considerably small. Now, when we have hemoglobin, which is bound to oxygen, there are two things which will determine the oxygen content. One is the saturation, which we see here, and the other is the concentration of the hemoglobin. Now, if this hemoglobin was low, or 15 or 14, then the patient is in extreme danger of tissue hypoxia. So these two factors play a major role when we talk about oxygen content. But the oxygen content depends upon the PO2 because this is the one fresh partial pressure determines how much of oxygen is transferred to the bloodstream for it to be bound with hemoglobin. So the oxygen binding capacity would be 1.34 ml of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood or deciliter. So that's what is the oxygen binding capacity. Now we have come to an important part, which is the hemoglobin. Now, if you look at the hemoglobin, it's a tetramer. Now it has two chains. One is the alpha chain and a beta chain. So there is one alpha one chain, alpha two chain, beta two and beta one. These are polypeptide chains. And apart from these chains, you have the heme molecule. So is tetramer, tetra means four, has four heme molecules and each heme molecules has a iron molecule. So if there are four heme molecules, there will be four oxygen, uh, four uh, iron molecules. So if there are four uh, uh, iron molecules, four molecules of oxygen will be attached on each one of them. So that is how the hemoglobin will attach the oxygen to the iron, which is, which is present. And this is with the iron pore firing ring, which you look at from the heme molecule. This is one iron which combines with the oxygen. Now, what happens to this hemoglobin? The configuration of this hemoglobin, all the conformational changes which happen in the hemoglobin are very important. This hemoglobin can exist in two forms. One is a tense form, the other is a relaxed form. What's the relevance? The tense form has low affinity for oxygen. That is, this is a deoxygenated hemoglobin. Whereas the relaxed form has high affinity for oxygen. So this is the oxygenated hemoglobin. So this is the one which goes towards the tissue, which promotes the release of oxygen. And this is where what happens to the alveoli, where more of oxygen is combined to the, to the hemoglobin for it to be transported to, be, to the tissues. And this is governed by something called as Bohr's effect. Now let's come to the Bohr's effect. Bohr's effect basically determines the transfer of oxygen to tissues. Now, when we talk about oxygen to tissues, it means that there is low pH in the tissues and there is high CO2. So the Bohr effect is to decrease the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin in an environment which has low pH and high CO2. That means the oxygen can easily be given off to these tissues and in return, it can take the carbon dioxide from here. So it will offload the oxygen and remove the carbon dioxide and transport it to the lungs to be excreted via alveolar ventilation. So that's the importance of Bohr's effect. How does it take place? So now I'm giving you a solution, a, 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 an environment where the hemoglobin exists in the low pH, where the pH levels are low. Now the hemoglobin, like I told you, has a beta subunit and it has got an alpha subunit. Now, if you look at the amino acids, the beta subunit has histidine and aspartate, while the alpha subunit has lysine. The importance here is that in low pH environments, the histidine residues become pronated, protonated. That becomes, they become positive because of H ions, right? And these H ions, because they are protonated, 
they can easily combine with the hydroxyl part on the other side forming a salt bridge so this kind of hemoglobin without the salt bridge is very unstable that's why it is called tensed so as soon as the oxygen is less a deoxygenated part of the hemoglobin is very tense it is taut so to stabilize this this is what happens there is a salt bridge which forms because of the because of the h ions which have accumulated and this salt bridge actually stabilizes the deoxygenated or the taut hemoglobin this is not at all so we talked about low ph how it helps to stabilize the deoxygenated state of the hemoglobin now let's come to the carbon dioxide or high carbon dioxide how does it help so the low ph formation of a salt bridge between the two dimers this bond stabilizes the deoxygenated state of the hemoglobin what does carbon dioxide do or high co2 do so the high co2 the co2 binds to the terminal amino groups which are present in the hemoglobin and become charged carbamate compounds these charged compa carbamate compounds then combine or form bridges against the negatively charged against the positively charged amino groups on the opposite side and they again form bridges and stabilize the hemoglobin how does it happen just what i told you so this is the alpha beta dimer this is the alpha beta dimer on the op opposite side look these are all positively charged amino groups all of them are positively charged amino groups now as soon as the co2 comes here it is c plus 2 o2 it displaces the hydrogen and combines with this terminal amino acids so this becomes negatively charged the same thing happens here so it becomes negatively charged so these negatively charged terminal amino groups which are called carbamate groups form salt bridges with the opposite opposite dimer which is which has positively charged amino groups and these bridges then stabilize the t state or the tens state of the hemoglobin so this is all what we talk about bohr's effect so the bohr's effect again to repeat to tell you is something uh, is the desaturated or the deoxygenated hemoglobin which is tensed up which is unstable so it releases oxygen that's why it is deoxygenated so when it releases oxygen it is deoxygenated it becomes taut the carbon dioxide comes in forms those salt bridges tries to stabilize it and the low environment which is there because of the h ions which are released also help to stabilize by forming salt bridges so that deoxygenated hemoglobin state is stabilized by these two factors hypercapnia and acidosis so this is what is called as bohr's effect now again what i told you in the uh, just to explain you the fixed principle in the lungs and the capillaries this is what happens the same i mean this is what happens at the tissue level so it is the gradient which which uh, which makes the hemoglobin which makes the partial pressure fall as the blood traverses through the tissues to the capillaries now let's come to another important part we talked about pao2 we talked about oxygen content and we talked about saturation what is the relationship between this these three now this relationship all the three is generally defined by the oxygen dissociation curve so here it is the pao2 on the x axis the y axis has the hemoglobin saturation on one side left side and the right side is the oxygen content that is oxygen per 100 ml of blood or 100 or ml of ox i mean ml of oxygen plus in 100 ml of blood so look at how you read the oxygen dissociation curve if you look at my animation i have drawn it from right to left if you draw it from right to left and read it from right to left you will be able to understand it well because this is the po2 at the alveolus and as the oxygen travels down slowly into the venous side into the capillaries the oxygen tension falls right that is the reason you should always look at the oxygen dissociation curve from right to left from the alveoli down to the capillaries 
Now, this is at the alveoli. At 40 millimeters of oxygen, you know this is the oxygen tension which will be there in the tissues at rest. So what do you come, what do you come, uh, come to know from this? You will know that the saturation where at the alveolus of the oxygen where the PO2 is 100, the saturation would be almost 97 to 100%, right? In the alveolus. But as it comes to the tissue, into the venous category, the saturation falls to about 75% of the hemoglobin, right? And the PO2 also falls to about 40 millimeters of mercury. So this is how the oxygen is traveling from the alveolus into the tissues. So this is what will be described as oxygen, which is unloaded to the tissue. This much amount of oxygen is unloaded from the tissues. So the oxygen content, if you look at here, we started with 20 or around 18 or 20. And then when it comes to the venous side, it falls to about 15 ml. And the saturation falls to 75, which is the venous saturation. If you expand this to about 600 millimeters of mercury, you'll find that the oxygen content can go up to 23 ml and the dissolved oxygen can go up from 0 0.003 to about 2 ml at 600 millimeters of mercury. So this is a very small fraction, but what we are concerned is this thing. Now we have also learned that this is a steep portion where the offloading is good. And beyond a certain point, if the saturation falls, the PO2 falls drastically. So there is a very fast decline in saturation beyond a particular PO2 levels. Let us say about 50 millimeters of mercury down to this level, the PO2 is in a steep curve and there will be a very fast fall of PO2. So if the arterial oxygen falls, if it starts from here, then you are, we are into a problem. Now let's talk about a little more about this oxygen dissociation curve because we are going to learn a lot from it. We also know there is something called as P50. Now, what does this P50 means? It means that at 27 millimeters of mercury pressure of PO2, the hemoglobin can be saturated to about to, to around 50 uh, to about 50 percent. That is what it means. Why P50? Because it is the middle of the curve. And any dissociation, any shift which happens to the left of the right, the maximum, the, the, the maximum point of change would occur at this point. That is why we normally take it as P50. If you look at the whole curve, this is in the, this is in the area where there's a fast decline. So if there is a shift towards the right, it will be the P50 reflection, which will give you a better measure because that's the fulcrum. So it will tell you what the fulcrum, where it is moving, and then how the saturations are being altered. Now, if you look at the oxygen dissociation curve, which has shifted to the right side, what happens to the alveolar uptake? Here, the alveolar uptake is decreased. So the oxygen content, which was about 20, has already fallen to about 70. The saturation, which was about 97, may have come to about 95. What happens to P50? It has shifted to the right. So a right shift means that for the hemoglobin to be saturated for 50%, where it required only 27 millimeters of mercury of PO2, now requires 40 millimeter of partial pressure. So it requires a higher partial pressures for the same saturation to be achieved. So the right shift means that there is decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity, which we can look in this area there because the oxygen content has fallen. Now, if there is a rightward shift because of hypercapnia, hyperthermia, or increased 2,3 dpg, or decreased pH, what will it lead to? The hemoglobin concentration remains the same, but it is not fully saturated because of a fall in PaO2. So if there is a fall in PaO2, then the hemoglobin will not be fully saturated because the gas transfer, the gradient has reduced 
as per the Fick's law of diffusion. That means if this occurs, we will have to increase the FiO2 to make sure that the oxygen content remains remains good and the tissue oxygen doesn't suffer. The other aspect is to remember that the hemoglobin tense form generally favors unloading. So whenever there is tissue hypoxia which is occurring, it will generally, the blood will try to give up oxygen to the tissues, whatever is their requirement or whatever it has. It becomes a donator, a big donator, a sant kind of a thing, a saint which gives away everything what it has to the tissues which require more. So that is what happens with the rightward shift. Now let's come to the other part, that is the leftward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. What happens here? You require a lesser PA, uh, a partial pressure of oxygen to saturate 50% of hemoglobin. But this increases the oxygen carrying capacity and the reasons are just the opposite what we have discussed in the rightward shift. What does it mean? It means that the hemoglobin is fully saturated, but the hemoglobin is in, an, is in a relaxed form and it favors loading of hemoglobin in the lungs. So in the lungs, because it is in relaxed form, it is getting oxygenated. Then this leftward shift means that more of saturation of hemoglobin will occur because of leftward shift. So a leftward shift is good for the blood to be oxygenated in the, in the, in the, uh, in the alveoli, but you need some sort of a rightward shift to offload, which will anyway occur when it comes to the venous level or to the capillaries. So the offloading, the unloading of tissues, actually here would be the proportion which you see here would be decreased. Now let's come to another aspect where all these three categories are required, required as well as now, what is oxygen delivery? This is uh, this we must know that there has to be a, a arterial oxygen content, which we have already known that it is the hemoglobin concentration and the saturation multiplied by 1.34 plus the plasma dissolved oxygen plus the uh, into the PO2. That will give us the arterial oxygen content. So if you if you uh, substitute all the values you'll have to multiply this content into 10 because this was in 100 ml and we have to convert this into liter. So this was in 100 ml and now we are converting into a liter. So we have to multiply it by 10. So we just got to know what the delivery should be. So when the oxygen content is multiplied by cardiac output, you will get the oxygen delivery. So the oxygen delivery, if you just substitute the values here, five liters is the oxygen delivery, 10 is to make it into liters per minute, and hemoglobin is 15, saturation is 97%, that is 0.97, then your oxygen delivery would be 1000 ml or one liter, which basically means oxygen content into cardiac output. Now, what do you mean by oxygen extraction? The oxygen is delivered, how does the tissues extract oxygen? How much is being extracted by the tissues is what we need to know. So that will be basically the uptake divided by the delivery into 100. This will give us a fraction. But if you minus uptake, I mean, uh, from the delivery and the uptake, then you will get just the extraction. But if you need a fraction of it, you will have to divide it and multiply it into 100 to get the fraction. So here it is. We say that the, that the consumption is at rest is always 250 ml and the delivery which we have got is about one liter into 100, the oxygen extraction ratio is about 25%. Now, how did we get this 250 ml? How did we deduce this? We always say 250 ml. Do we have a reason to say how this 250 ml has come here? The delivery we know is based on 20 ml, which is the oxygen content in the artery into cardiac output, which has given us 1000 ml. The total venous content 
is 15 ml. If you remember the, the uh, oxygen dissociation curve, where it is 75% saturated and the PaO2 was 40 millimeters. So with that we got the, ox the oxygen, total oxygen content on the venous side was 15 ml into the total volume will give us 750 ml. So the oxygen consumption would be a difference of the two, which is 250 Once we get this difference, we'll, we'll have a QA. QA will request the ACT. What is the oxygen consumption? And if you divide the two, you will be able to get what is the oxygen extraction. Now, how this is important to us? Why do we need to consider this? Here we have taken a constant. Delivery is one liter. Oxygen extraction ratio will be consumption upon delivery into 100. Now, let's consider this is the venous side. So the venous side, if you see 15 ml, this is the oxygen content into whatever the cardiac, whatever is the cardiac out or five liters, the volume which we take 15 into five, you get 70, 750 ml. The extraction is 25%. What happens if the oxygen content falls to 10 or 50% in the venous side? So 50% of a uh, 50% uh, saturation. And if you look at the oxygen content, which has fallen to 10, so 10 into 5 liters gives you 500 ml. The extraction, if you substitute the values, 500 upon 1,000 into 100, you get 50%. And this happens in sepsis and increased metabolic state. What about if the oxygen extraction is 10%? Again, if you look at the oxygen content is 18 ml, 18 into 5 would give you, would give you the oxygen content here. And if you substitute these values into 100, the extraction is about 10%, which happens in hypothermia. So this oxygen dissociation curves gives you a lot of information when you talk about extraction and delivery also. What happens on the other side? Let us say the oxygen delivery here, oxygen content here is 20 ml. Into five liters, we take into 10 to get into liters, we get a content of about 1000 ml. Venous side, it is 50, 500 ml, and then you get an oxygen, I mean, the oxygen extraction ratio. But if this, but if this hemoglobin is reduced from 15 to 7.5, what will happen? Now look at the, this side of the graph. Even if it, the hemoglobin is decreased, the saturation will not be affected. The saturation, the 7.5 hemoglobin can again always be saturated with the full amount, can be always be saturated to the full amount of it. So that is what is the significance of hemoglobin which can be saturated, but this is an important aspect as far as tissue oxygenation is concerned. So if it is 10 ml, then you have a five liters cardiac output, your oxygen delivery is only 500 ml. But does it remain so? No, the body tries to compensate. The cardiac output has improved to seven liters with the content remaining the same. And you'll find the delivery can be enhanced to about 700. So these are how the compensatory mechanisms take place to make sure that the tissues get enough of oxygen. Now let's come to how we equate oxygen consumption with oxygen delivery. So this is the graph which we'll normally see. This is the oxygen delivery which is happening. So this part of the graph, which is a straight line, actually says that the oxygen consumption is independent of oxygen supply. But here, the oxygen consumption is dependent on the oxygen supply. So that's the point where it starts to dip. It call, it's called the critical delivery uh, oxygen content. So if you have a saturation of 98% here, SCO2 is 75%, the extraction would be normal. But at this point, the saturation may still remain 98%, but the venous saturation will dip to 50% and the oxygen extraction is maximum at this point. Beyond that, there is going to be a problem. The tissue hypoxia is going to occur and that is where there will be oxygen depth and the lactate will start rising from this level. 
So just remember that this is the point where the scale tilts towards oxygen depth and tissue hypoxia and cellular injury. The cellular injury increases from here to here where cell death can occur. So it's at 50% oxygen saturation in the tissues, which is, a, which is the point where we need to take care of. What happens in sepsis? We all know that the critical DO2 is shifted from 250 to 400 because the oxygen consumption here has risen. It was generally around this point, but it has gone up to this point. The delivery of oxygen, which is happening, which is almost the same 400 ml, but this delivery now at this point, the consumption is very high so that the S50 will shift here. What do we need to do here? We'll have to maintain the cardiac output to match the consumption. So we'll have to increase the preload to balance the cardiac output. And we may have to increase the blood pressure by your inotropes to see that the cardiac output is maintained and it matches the oxygen consumption here, trying to increase the delivery to match the consumption. That's what we will have to do in sepsis. So the limits of oxygen saturations are like this. More than 75%, it's normal. DO2 is always more than consumption. From 75% to 50%, it can compensate the extraction. But there is a decreasing delivery trend and there is an increasing O2 demand. At 50 to 30%, there is almost exhaustion. The delivery is less than the consumption and there occurs beginning of lactic acidosis. 30 to 25%, you have severe lactic acidosis. And if the SVO2 falls to less than 25, then there is cellular death. So last component about CO2 transport. Thank you for bearing with me. I thought I will go slow because a lot of graphics were involved. I did not want to rush through because then you will not understand. Please excuse me, my chairpersons and the listeners. Now let's come to the CO2 transport. Now we all call about CO2 transport by what is called as the Haldane effect. Now this Haldane effect is nothing but the exchange of oxygen in relation to CO2. It's a physiochemical phenomena which describes that there is an increased capacity of oxygen of, of blood to carry carbon dioxide under conditions of decreased hemoglobin saturation. Now just try to recollect what I told you. I told you how the carbon dioxide comes, combines with the, car, uh, with, the carbon, uh, with the carbamate, forms the carbamate compounds, stabilize the deoxygenated hemoglobin. So as soon as the hemoglobin is tensed, the oxygen is released, therefore it is tensed. The carbon dioxide comes and stabilizes it or takes away its tension. It helps as a counselor or a psychiatrist. So that is what the carbon dioxide does to stabilize the tensed hemoglobin. And that is what is called as Haldane's effect. Now, how does this carbon dioxide transport occurs? There are three mechanisms which are involved, the bicarbonates, the carbamates, and that dissolved carbon dioxide. The majority of the CO2 transport occurs by, car uh, by, by, carbonate, uh, by bicarbonates. So this is what is combined with water so you have CO2, which will combine with water, form carbonic acid. It can be a spontaneous reaction or it can be a reaction which is aided by carbonic anhydrase. And this carbonic acid will dissociate to give you bicarbonate and H ions. Now what happens when there is, this happens in the RBCs. Remember this is in the red blood cells. So when more of, a bicarbonate is formed, the RBCs push the bicarbonate out into the plasma in exchange for chlorides. So the chlorides come inside the RBCs and the bicarbonate is pushed into the plasma from the RBCs because there is excess of bicarbonate, ex uh, 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 I mean, excess of bicarbonate inside the RBCs. So this is defined as the chloride shift. Now, what about carbamates? It is only accounts to about 10 to 20%. And we have seen the reaction of this with when we talked about the carbamate, how the ox carbon dioxide displaces H ions, combines with the carbamates, 
turns them into negatively charged and then they form a bridge so that's how it forms it forms it turns the carbamino uh, carb amino acids into carbamates and this carbamates the hn is gone and this is what is a carbamate base which accounts for 10 to 20% you may say it is 10 to 20% but it is extremely important because this form of transport of carbon dioxide is independent of co2 or of bicar uh, bicar formation so when a person is exercising when the carbon dioxide accumulation or the metabolism is a uh, production is extremely high this is the one which compensates to carry carbon dioxide to the alveoli because you this takes some time and this intermediary reaction is not required for transportation of carbon dioxide in the form of carbamate base dissolved oxygen you know it is because of the henry's law and the henry law states that the amount of dissolved gas in a liquid is proportional to the partial pressure above the liquid that means that with 1 mm pco2 will increase the blood concentration of the pc of, of the co2 by 0.03 ml per liter so if it is 0.3 0.03 millimoles per liter per mg and if you multiply that by the pcpco2 the total content of dissolved co2 would be about 1.2 millimoles per liter now why is it that that majority of the co2 is carried by the in, in form of bicarbonates why 85% or 70 to 90 75 to 90% is only by bicarbonate so just remember that the halden effect is due to increase buffering of the hemoglobin so as soon as the hemoglobin loses the oxygen it is called deoxygenated hemoglobin so the hemoglobin tetramer becomes more basic there is increased ph of the rbc cytosol and because of this there is more bicarbonate uh, bi uh, carbonic acid which dissociates into bicarbonate and therefore total amount of carbon dioxide which is carried as bicarbonate is increased so this is what leads to the 85 to 70 to 90% burden of bicarbonate which is carried by the uh, which is transported by in form of bicarbonates now as we have the oxygen dissociation curve we also have the carbon dioxide dissociation curve now look at this and you will come to know how it contributes how the various components contribute to transport again you see bicarbonate forms the majority of it and as the pco2 rises the bicarbonate also rises equal uh, i mean uh, rises along with it so there is an increase in bicarbonate carriage with an increase in pco2 look at the dissolved oxygen there is a minor linear relationship which occurs but it never exceeds much or it never it can never be to what it is how the bicarbonate is carried on the other hand look at the carbamates the carbamates if you look at the arterial and the venous carbonate they do not show any change in the venous and the arterial content whatever was at 10 mm of mercury the same content remains here so what is important for us when we talk about co2 is not the partial pressure of co2 but the content of co2 how it is carried by the blood as we talked about the oxygen content here as well we need to look at the co2 content how it is carried by the blood now look at the two points when we look at the arterial pco2 level there is an arterial point here which corresponds to the content on to this side and this will correspond to about 22 millimoles per liter that is the concentration but on the venous side the pco2 is around 45 so there is a venous point what does it mean why do these two points exist and what are, what is their relevance in carbon dioxide carriage now if you look at this two points you will be able to understand that the halden effect is actually the difference in the quantity of co2 that is the content at constant pco2 in oxygenated and deoxygenated blood 
how does it happen now we talked about this venous point we talked about this arterial point so the pco2 we are trying to keep constant and see what happens to that so look at the uh, look at the concentration we talked about millimoles there here we are talking about ml per liter so that was millimoles per liter when we talked about so on the arterial side it is about 480 which is much less then 520 which is present on the venous side but there is a marginal difference only in the pco2 levels so there is a remarkable difference in content rather than the pco2 now the saturations which we have seen on the right side for venous it is 75 for arterial it is 100% now if there is an increase in oxygen content uh, the carbon dioxide content it occurs as a result of lower oxygen saturation so as the saturation of the of the hemoglobin comes down the the carbon dioxide content rises so the more the oxygen uh, the hemoglobin desaturates the more carbon dioxide it can carry on the other side if there is increase in pco2 now don't confuse for content this is talking about pco2 increase so if there is an increase in pco2 from 40 to 46 as a result of increased oxygen more carbon dioxide is released from binding sites that's why there is an increased pco2 but the content remains the same so just remember the correlation here that when we talk of a shift from the pco2 of 40 to 46 more of carbon dioxide is released therefore the pco2 may rise but the content would remain the same so look look at this white point here at pco2 of 40 if we increase the pco2 to 40 mm the content here would remain the same it doesn't alter even though the partial pressure has increased from 40 to 60 that is what it means so if we were here we increase the partial pressure to 46 but the content will remain the same on the left side of the of the uh, y axis so that is what it basically means is there a difference in oxygen uh, the carbon dioxide content on the arterial and the venous side we know it was 22.5 on the venous side which was more as compared to the arterial side where it where it is 20.5 ml look at the cellular and the rbcs if there is any difference between them you will find in the carbamates in the acellular there is no difference the basic difference is again in the bicarbonate but in rbcs there is a difference in the carbamate compound carried and that is what we were talking about that all this carbamate formation which occurs is occurring inside the rbcs right it is not in the plasma so let's come to the end now this was the oxygen dissociation curve which we saw let's superimpose the carbon dioxide cascade here so we start with 40 mm here it comes it got goes up to 46 and then diffusion into the lungs it is carried to the lungs it diffuses across mixes with the dead space this is what is the etco2 you get this is what the pseo2 you get and then it goes into the atmosphere so just to summarize this is one flow chart which i have made oxygen transport can occur through convection where car where cardiac output is most important so if the cardiac output uh, falls the delivery of oxygen can be reduced diffusion is a passive process it can occur because of pressure gradient which is governed by fick's law then you come with the bohr's effect when the oxygen gets transferred from microcirculation to the tissues and the mitochondria the oxygen dissociation curve plays an important role which tells you about the oxygen consumption and when you come to both of them you can get the oxygen extraction ratios thank you very much thank you dr kudra for the wonderful illustrative lecture I request Dr. Jayeshri to answer the question session since Dr. Pandit wants to leave early. Oh, I must uh, apologize. <laughs> I'm getting a phone call tomorrow from the bank because there are some meetings going on.
please excuse me, ma'am, and my participants. I I need to rush back. But okay. if you answer or send the questions through email, I may like to respond to the email questions which come. But uh, I am sure Dr. Ga uh, Dr. Sood is much learned and experienced than me. She's been a fabulous teacher and a professor emeritus. If you can call her, she'll be able to answer all the questions. Pankaj, Pankaj, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will not uh, uh, stop you, of course, from your other appointments. But the last few sentences are not true. <laughs> your your lecture is always excellent and so clear and so. I mean, your basics are so good. And thanks a lot. And I'm sure if the students have some questions, uh, they can email to you. Thank you very much, Pankaj. A pleasure to hear you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Dr. Pangaj is leaving us. Thank you, Pangaj, yeah. for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Daljeet, Dr. Vidyash, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shobha. I'm not able to get back, Dr. Shobha. My apologies. So, it's all right, sir. It's all right. <laughs> Dr. Vidyash, you are requested to introduce Dr. Shobha Flip yeah, and sure. carry on with that. Yeah, good evening, all. Now coming to the next talk in this uh, respiratory physiology module, we have the talk on ventilation perfusion ratio. It's a very important topic because changes in this ventilation perfusion ratio can affect gas exchange and can contribute to hypoxemia and various other effects. So to talk to us regarding this very important topic on ventilation perfusion ratio, we have with us Dr. Shoba Philip, who is the head of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at Lourdes Hospital, Kuchin. She has many publications to her credit, and she's a senior faculty at most of the anesthesiology and critical care conferences, both at the state as well as at the national level. Over to you, ma'am, for your talk. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for having me here for the ICA webinar. So Dr. Pangaj Kundra has made my uh, talk slightly easier. So I'll be dealing with this topic, ventilation perfusion, under three headings. That is the basic concepts. What is ventilation perfusion? What are the types of ventilation perfusion? The laws that guide it? What are the different zones in the lung? And what is ventilation perfusion in the different zones? And finally, what as an NC soldier we are supposed to know. So ventilation refers to the volume of air that is inhaled and exhaled per minute. As we all know, it is the product of the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. Whereas perfusion is the total volume of blood which is reaching the pulmonary capillaries in a given time period, namely one minute. So in an ideal situation, the V by Q it should be one. However, it varies with the position, especially in the standing upright position. At the apex, the V by Q is 3.3. And at the base, it is 0.63 because ventilation is relatively better at the apex and perfusion is relatively better at the base. So overall, V by Q ratio is 0.8. So the same thing what Sir had said before, when we regard the delivery of oxygen, we know that it is the product of the cardiac output and the content of arterial blood. Cardiac output is the product of stroke volume and heart rate. CaO2, that is the content of arterial blood, is the product of the 1.34, that is the amount of oxygen that is attached to hemoglobin, the hemoglobin value and the saturation, plus the oxygen in the dissolved form, that is 0 0.003 into the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. So if we uh, project all these variables, the final delivery of oxygen, uh, DO2, is determined by SV, stroke volume, into heart rate, into 1.34, into hemoglobin, into saturation of oxygen, plus 0 0.003 into PaO2. So to increase the delivery of oxygen, we have to increase the content of arterial oxygen. So how can we do that? We can increase either the hemoglobin or we can increase the FiO2 so that the saturation increases. But as we all saw from the previous slides, the oxygen dissociation curve is a sigmoid curve. So if we increase the FiO2 from 90% to 100%, it causes only a marginal increase in the arterial oxygen content. This is very important because many a times I see the junior ancestors when they see that the saturation is coming down, they try to increase the 
FiO2 in the ventilator. So what we should understand is that we are not going to gain much, only a marginal increase. So what is the best variable that we have to increase the arterial oxygen content? It is the hemoglobin. So always optimize your hemoglobin. What is alveolar ventilation? Amount of air that is used for gas exchange. As uh, the previous speaker said, alveolar ventilation is tidal volume minus depth space into the respiratory rate. That is for, a, if we take a tidal volume is 500 ml, it is minus 150 ml the dead space into 12 the respiratory rate, the total is 4,200 or 4.2 liters per minute. So when respiratory physiology, what we mean by ventilation is the part of air which is taking part in gas exchange every minute. Ventilation perfusion ratio is therefore the ratio of the alveolar ventilation to the amount of blood that is perfusing the alveoli. That is V by Q, 4,200 divided by 5,000, which is 0 0.84. What is shunt? It means the blood is flowing through areas of the lung where ventilation is more than perfusion or where perfusion is more than ventilation or through areas where there is no ventilation at all. So this is best described by the Berggren equation, which states that QS by QT. QS is the shunt flow per minute as a fraction of the total cardiac output is equal to CCO2 minus CaO2. CCO2 is the pulmonary and capillary oxygen. CaO2 is the arterial oxygen content divided by CCO2 minus CVO2, where CVO2 is the mixed venous oxygen content. Some points we should uh, keep in mind are Hypoxemia cannot be corrected by just increasing the FiO2 to 100%. Why? As Sir said before, the shunted blood is not exposed to the increase in oxygen uh, by your ventilation. So whatever oxygen you increase by ventilation, if there is shunting, you cannot increase or we cannot decrease the hypoxemia. Shunt results always in a decrease in PaO2, but it does not usually increase the PCO2. Why? Because when there is hypoxemia, the chemoreceptor sends the increase in the PCO2 and stimulates hyperventilation. And this results in actually a decrease in PCO2. What are the types of shunt that we see? So there is the zero V by Q, which means that the V, the ventilation is in the numerator and perfusion is in the denominator part. So when there is no ventilation, but perfusion is normal, as in ARDS or complete airway obstruction or hydropneumothorax, there is no ventilation taking place. It's only the denominator that is present. So it is actually zero by Q, that is zero. That is called zero VQ. What is low VQ? That means the VQ is less than one or less than the ideal. That occurs in partial airway obstruction as seen in pulmonary fibrosis because the compliance is reduced, or it can occur when there is a surfactant deficiency, or in COPD or bronchial asthma, where the resistance to airflow is increased. Here, the total ratio is less than one. What is VQ of infinity? That is called dead space VQ. That means there is no perfusion, but ventilation is normal. This is commonly seen in pulmonary embolism or PE, because here there is no perfusion. The artery is blocked but ventilation is going on. So it is a dead space ventilation. The last is high VQ. That is the VQ is more than one. This occurs when the ventilation is normal or high and perfusion is reduced. If the patient is having a hypotension, reduced cardiac output, naturally the perfusion will be reduced, but ventilation may be normal. So in such a case, it is called high VQ or VQ more than one. So a ventilation perfusion mismatch, when does this occur? This occurs when there's a regional difference in the alveolar capillary membrane. And as Sir explained beautifully, oxygen is a perfusion limited gas. That is, it is determined by the partial pressure. So the difference in partial pressure helps in the diffusion of oxygen. Now, many of us may ask, is PE, pulmonary embolism, a dead space or is it a shunt? It is actually an ex example of dead space because here there is a decrease in perfusion related to ventilation. Okay, so this here, the shunt occurs and uh, the shunt can be viewed as an extreme form of VQ where the ratio is zero. So most patients with pulmonary embolism 
present with low PCO2 because of the hyperventilation. And what do you find in the ABG is a respiratory alkalosis. So it is a dead space ventilation that you see in pulmonary embolism. Another factor which we should keep in mind is what is the role of gravity? Gravity triggers changes in ventilation and perfusion by two mechanisms. One is the pleural pressure, which is increased at the base. So the alveoli at the base are more compliant and ventilation improves when the patient is in the upright position. Second is the hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is less at the apex, so perfusion is less at the apex. But perfusion improves with gravity, so there is a great, the greatest amount of perfusion you get at the base of the lung. So when the patient exercises, when there's an increased cardiac output, the area of the lung which benefits by a relative increase in perfusion is actually the middle and the epical zone because already the basal part of the lung is having a very good perfusion. So this is the same equation as I showed, showed you before del regarding delivery of oxygen. Alveolar gas equation shows the change in alveolar O2 pressure for every change in alveolar carbon dioxide. PaO2 is equal to FiO2 into the atmospheric pressure minus the pressure of water vapor and the alveolus at 37 degrees centigrade, that is 47 millimeter mercury, minus the PaCO2, that is partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood divided by the respiratory portion. And Dr. Pankaj Kundra has given a detailed uh, explanation about alveolar oxygen pressure and how it changes. So this is a picture of how a shunt occurs. So you can see oxygenated blood on one side, on the other side, this poorly oxygenated blood, and totally when the outflow comes, there's a decreased oxygen. So when we look at the alveolus, this is the picture of the alveolus and the capillary. Here you can see the, what we are going to uh, hypothesize is that the oxygen in the plasma can be roughly taken uh, as equivalent to oxygen in the plasma of the pulmonary vein. What happens in a healthy lung? So the oxygen is getting into the alveolus, the blood flow is uh, taking place properly, both the V and Q are very good, so V by Q is normal, that is 0 0.8. Second is a case of airway block chronic bronchitis. What do you find? There are secretions in the alveolus. The capillary flow is normal, but the ventilation is reduced. The oxygen level is low. So V by Q reduces, the PaO2 reduces, and there is an increased alveolar arterial gradient. What happens in pneumonia? In pneumonia, again, oxygenation is reduced because there is inflammation of the lung. Secretions and fluid also get collected. So there is a low ventilation, but perfusion is normal. So the oxygen entering the capillary is reduced. You get a reduced oxygen in the capillary. And so you get, again, an increased alveolar arterial grade. What happens in pulmonary vein? Here, the fluid is filling up the alveoli. So the partial pressure of oxygen is very low in the arterial blood because the oxygen is not being able to be delivered to the capillary but the perfusion is normal. So if you extrapolate it to the ratio V by Q, it is zero by Q. So it is a zero shunt. So here there is severe hypoxia and severe increase in arte alveolar arterial uh, gradient because the blood is not getting oxygenated. In pulmonary embolism, as you can see, the uh, pulmonary vessel is blocked by the thrombus. The alveolar is collapsing. Ventilation is taking place, but perfusion is zero. So it is V by Q is equal to V by zero. So it is a dead space ventilation. And different areas of the lung also show low VQ. So finally, it results in an increased alveolar arterial gradient. So before we go on to the zones of the lung, there are four principles uh, which help us to understand the different ventilation perfusion mechanisms in the different zones. And these four principles are the Ohm's law, the Poisson's law, Starling's principle, and the effect of gravity. So Ohm's law, uh, is, it can be extrapolated to fluid mechanisms where the flow depends upon the partial pressure difference uh, uh, divided by the R, that is the radius of the tube. Whereas in Poisson's law, it states that the volume flux, that is, the flux is depending on the change in pressure uh, into the constant into the radius of the tube raised to four, 
divided by eight into viscosity into length of pipe. So if the pipe is dilated, then the flow will be more. But if the if the that is if the radius is more, if the radius of the vessel is more, four times the radius, then the flow will become better. So these laws are described in physics, and when it extrapolates to blood, because blood is not a homogeneous fluid, it is not always correct. But these are the basic principles based on which zones are described. So this is just like a waterfall. So it is called the waterfall mechanism. I will explain when I show you the zones of the lung. That is, you imagine that there is a chamber and there is an alveolar pressure in the chamber. So you see the pulmonary artery pressure at one end and the pulmonary venous pressure at the other end. So if the alveolar pressure is low, that means the blood flow will be determined by the difference in pressure between the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. But if the alveolar pressure is high, it will compress the pulmonary capillary and then the capillary will collapse and blood flow is determined only by the pulmonary artery pressure. Coming to the zones of lung, the different zones of lung initially described were three, but now it has been uh, said that there are actually four zones of the lung. So the first zone is the zone where alveolar ventilation the, is more than the arterial pressure, is more than the venous pressure. So there is no blood flow because the alveolus is full and the alveolar pressure is higher than the arterial pressure. So no blood flow takes place there. In the zone two, that is called the waterfall area, the alveolar pressure is less than the arterial pressure. So the flow is dependent on the pressure in the arterial side. Here, there is an intermittent blood flow taking place during the systole. Okay, the zone three is the area where there is very good blood flow because the alveolar pressure is much less than even the venous pressure. So the arterial pressure is more than the venous pressure and the venous pressure is also more than the alveolar pressure. So you get very good uh, blood flow in zone three. And the off late, there is a zone four that is described where the interstitial pressure comes into play. And here the flow is very less compared to zone three. Ventilation is also less because the arterial pressure uh, the flow is determined by the arterial pressure and arterial pressure, it should be more than the interstitial pressure for some flow to take place. The same thing, zones of the lung describe uh, what was shown. This is in another schematic diagram, which I have. So basically what we should understand is that the ventilation is more better at the apex of the lung and less towards the base whereas perfusion is just the reverse. It is better at the base of the lung and it is less at the apex. But when the effect of gravity comes, ventilation also becomes better at the base. Same thing shown, but for every height, there is a difference. That is, when you say the perfusion increases from apex to base, there is an increase in perfusion by one centimeter water for every one centimeter height, whereas ventilation, it reduces from the apex to the base. So the difference is 0.5 centimeter for one centimeter water. So it is not actually equal. That is because of some areas getting less ventilation. That is why you get a mild mismatch, but VQ up to 0.8 is taken as normal. This is the effect of gravity. What happens in gravity? In gravity, as you see in the diagram, the perfusion is best in the zone Three. Okay. What happens to ventilation? Ventilation, what we learn is that ventilation is better at the apex than at the base. But with the effect of gravity, what happens? The basal part of the lung, though the alveolar at collapse, they're more compliant. So with the effect of gravity, ventilation also starts increasing when the effect of gravity comes. Okay. So this is the picture showing the effect of gravity on the different zones of the lung. As you can see that uh, the pulmonary blood flow increases by one centimeter per centimeter height, whereas the ventilation increases by only 0.5 centimeter for every one centimeter height. So both the ventilation 
and the blood flow increase from apex to base with the effect of gravity, but at different rate. The same thing which I said before, the same, same thing again to show you the changes in the ventilation perfusion in the different parts of the lung, the effect of the arterial, the alveolar, the venous, and lastly, the zone four where the interstitial pressure comes into play. So what happens when you change from the upright to the supine position? So in the upright position, we have got zone one, two, three. When the patient becomes supine, the zone one is no more there. There's only zone two and zone three. And actually the effect of gravity plays from the anterior to the posterior. It's not from top to bottom. The effect of gravity is from the anterior part of the lung to the posterior part of the lung. So what happens when you change from upright to supine is that gravity still exists, but the effect of the lung is distributed differently. So zone one becomes zone two, zone two becomes zone three, and there is an improvement in the ventilation perfusion mismatching. The, there is increased blood flow to the central part of the circulation. And when supine, the gradient is always from anterior to posterior part of the lung. If this patient becomes hypovolemic, what happens? The cardiac output decreases. When the cardiac output decreases, the zone three is converted to zone two, and the zone two is converted to zone one. And there is a worsening when uh, VQ mismatching if the patient is in the upright position. What happens if the same uh, patient suffers a C5, C6 spinal cord injury? Here, the patient is not able to take breath properly. The lung volumes decrease. There is more retroelectasis. There is lower tidal volume and lower ventilation. And so overall, the alveolar pressure is reduced. C5, C6 injury also affects the accessory respiratory muscles. And this decreases the ability to take a deep breath. So overall, the alveolar pressure will be reduced when the patient has got a C5, C6 spinal cord injury. So what happens to the zone at that time? There is less of zone one. There is more of zone two or three, and there is more of zone four. So when the patient loses the ability to breathe, what happens? There is more of zone four. That is more alveoli will be under the effect of the interstitial pressure, more alveoli will be collapsed. And there is some amount of two, uh, zone two and three, but there is less of zone one. Now, as ansitis, what are we supposed to know? What happens to the patient when the patient is in awake state as well as in the ansitis form? So in the awake state, the patient is in the lateral decubitus position. If you look at the volume to the pressure changes, you can see that the non-dependent lung has got a better volume change compared to the dependent lung. But still, the dependent lung will also be having adequate volume change because the pressure curve is in the sigmoid form. When the patient becomes anesthetized in the lateral decubitus position, the upper, that is the non-dependent lung, is on the higher part of the curve compared to the dependent lung, mainly because the effect of the diaphragm is lost, the abdominal con contents are also pushing. So though both reduce, the upper lung is at an advantageous position compared to the dependent lung. The same patient, patient is in the anesthetized position, lateral decubitus position, and with an open chest, like in thoracic surgery. What happens to the non-dependent lung? Here, the ventilation is quite good, but there is an open chest. And what happens to the dependent lung? Dependent lung has got better perfusion, but there is also the effect of gravity and the compression by the mediastinal structures causing suboptimal positioning. So the dependent lung will have less amount of ventilation. What happens when the patient changes from supine to prone? So in the supine position, as you can see, the ventral alveoli are over distended, whereas the dorsal alveoli or the alveoli in the posterior part are collapsed. Okay, 
but the perfusion is very good at the posterior part compared to the uh, anterior or the ventral part when the same person is lying in the prone position the dorsal alveoli become better open the ventilation is better when the dorsal part of the lung this is the basis for putting a patient in the prone position if the patient is spontaneously breathing and if the patient is having a desaturation the patients are now encouraged to lie prone so that the dorsal alveoli are better uh, ventilated you get better saturation so it, this is the picture showing what happens to the lung in ARTS. So you see there's an injured alveolus during the acute phase, a lot of inflammatory markers coming in, and the alveolar capillary membrane is broken. And this total loss of uh, membrane and this total ventilation perfusion is managed. So if the patient is in the supine position and patient is having an ARTS, what we see that the ventral part of the lung is better ventilated compared to the dorsal part of the lung. But the same patient, you put him in the prone position, the posterior alveoli, which are more compliant, is now better ventilated. So the saturation picks up. This is a diagram showing what is the effect of PEEP in a person. If you're given, giving uh, PEEP from the same machine to both parts of the lung, what happens to the non-dominant or the non-dependent lung? To that lung will get better ventilated compared to the dependent part of the lung, which is under pressure because of the medial strand structures and the abdominal fluids. So in same person, you can improve the saturation by giving a selective PEEP, PEEP which is selected through two different incision machines so that the, both the lungs get better amount of ventilation. So the ratio from two by third and one third is shifted to half and half in each case. This is just to show what is the effect of PEEP on the non-dominant and the dominant lung. So what are the implications to the anesthesiologist? We should know what is the effect of our anesthesia on the upper airway, on all the volumes of the lung, on the FRC of reoxygenation, on the dead space, on the ventilatory responses, on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction effect of position, effect of mechanical ventilation and regional anesthesia. All these things should go through our mind when we try to optimize the oxygenation in the patient. What happens when in the upper airway, when you give anesthesia, there is loss of muscle tone, there's loss of reflexes. So on the whole, there is decrease in ventilation. What happens to the volumes of the lung? On the whole, the uh, FR, FRC is reduced, your tidal volumes are reduced. So unless you optimize your tidal volumes and the respiratory rates, you cannot maintain the volumes of the lung. And what happens to the FRC? The FRC reduces with anesthesia, even if the patient is on spontaneous or controlled ventilation. On the whole, if the FRC is around three liters, just by shifting the patient from upright to supine, it reduces by one liter. And a further reduction in 0.5, liters to 0.8 liters by your anesthesia. So it will come close to the residual volume. What is the effect of pre-oxygenation? When we pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen, as Sir said before, you are going to cause an adsorption atelectasis. So giving 100% oxygen is not good because it will cause 100, uh, adsorption atelectasis. So you have to limit the amount of time to which you give 100% oxygen. What is the effect of dead space? The same thing which was shown in the previous slides. As we know that we have to remember that it is the alveolar ventilation that we should be bothered about because the, if the dead space is increased, if, you, if the, you have to take into consideration the dead space of the apparatus also when you are giving anesthesia for the patient. What is the effect of anesthesia on ventilator responses? We must understand that ventilation, the most important stimulus is the PCO2. And most of the uh, anesthetic agents will affect the PCO2. Okay, so it's not the hypoxic drive, it is the PCO2 buildup which stimulates the ventilation. And what is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? So whenever there 
under perfused areas. So, uh, hypoxic pulmonary vaso construction is a protective mechanism, and that is also affected by muscipa and. it has got effect on the ventilation part. Usually regional anesthesia is safer, does not affect the lung mechanics much. Sorry for the disturbance. So overall, these are some of the questions I have just put to just make the PGs understand. So the first question is, if the saturation of the patient is 92%, which of the following will increase the delivery of oxygen? Increase in stroke volume by 10%, increase in heart rate by 5%, increase hemoglobin by 12%, or increase saturation by 5%, increase the PaO2 by 30%. You have to choose the best answer for this. Chaba, madam, uh, can you go to the slideshow slide show. so that all the options are readable? Yeah, just a minute. Okay. Okay, if fine. the saturation uh, of the yeah. Yes. Should I question once more? And uh, no need. I think uh, it should be readable now. No I'll I'll put the poll window so that uh, audience okay. put their choices. Okay. There are five options. I think more people can choose their best option. Be nice if some more people, some more people they put your option. Yeah. We'll end the poll in another um, five seconds time. Okay. The result is there. Dr. Shobha, you can continue. Okay. Should I go to the next question or discuss no, we, this? No, no we, we'll explain the answer and proceed. Because um, option C was chosen by 53% people. And uh, next uh, was option E, 27%. Those are uh, less numbers. So option C is the best answer, like how I explained the best variable that you have to improve the delivery of oxygen is by increasing the hemoglobin. Because if you increase the FiO2 to try to increase the saturation, there is not much change taking place. So the best answer is by increasing the hemoglobin by 12%. Shall I go to the next yes. question? Yes. yes, yeah. Yeah, we'll go to the second question. Okay, in the normal upright position, A, ventilation decreases from apex to base. 
B, ventilation increases from apex to base. C, perfusion increases from apex to base. D, perfusion decreases from apex to base. E says A and C are correct. And F says B and D are correct. We have to choose the best option. Uh, because I, I have a poll window only for five options. If F is yep. the answer, yep. you can put down the chat. If you feel option F is the right answer, you can text it down the chat window. Okay. okay. Almost time to wind up the poll. Sixty-seven percent believes it's uh, option E. Yes, yes, that is the correct answer. Option E is the correct answer. That is, ventilation is best at the apex. It decreases from apex to base, and perfusion increases from apex to base. A and C are correct. E is the best option. Next question. The next question is: When you change from the upright to the supine position, it causes number one. Zone 1 changes to zone 2 and zone 2 changes to zone 3. Second option is zone 2 changes to zone 1 and zone 3 changes to zone 2. Third option is zone 3 disappears, which is the best option. When you change, change from upright to supine. Okay. I'm, I'm putting the poll window. Forget about the option D. You need to select between A, B and C. I think more people can put your opinion heard. We'll wind up in five seconds time. Yes. So this is the response, ma'am. Yes, yes. Option A is the best answer. Zone one changes to two and zone two changes to three. That is the best answer. We go to the next question. Zero shunt is seen in a, pneumonia, B, chronic bronchitis, C, pulmonary edema, and D, hypotension. Zero shunt. You have to choose the best answer. The poll window is there. We will close the poll in another five seconds time. Okay, fine. So this is the result. Yes, the best answer is pulmonary edema because there is no oxygen getting in. So the V is zero, whereas perfusion is taking place. So it is a zero shunt. The last question is ARDS benefits by A, peep in the lateral position, peep in the supine position, and peep in the prone position. Again, your poll window will have four options. Forget about option D. Choose between option A, B, or C. Yeah, interestingly, more people are uh, voting now. We'll close the poll in another five seconds because a good number of people have already uh, put their opinion. Okay. okay. So the best answer is peep in the prone position because your dorsal alveoli are better ventilated when the patient is prone. So your people have better effect in the prone position. So the moral of the story is Respiratory physiology is very complex. We have to understand the basic concepts and that is very vital for the MC service.
when there is a reduced ventilation it leads to type 1 respiratory failure progress to type 2 whereas when there is a reduced perfusion it leads to blood getting redirected to other areas of the lung these are my references thank you Thank you, ma'am, for a comprehensive presentation on ventilation and perfusion ratios. Uh, I think we'll have a few question answers in the chat. I think we can take a few questions, right, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. I hope uh, I could make it as simple as possible. Yeah, sure, sure. It was, it was a lucid presentation. And uh, during this, when you have a ventilation perfusion mismatch, uh, hypoxia is, uh, is almost uh, present. What happens to the PCO2 actually? There is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Actually, when there is a shunt, there is not much effect on the PCO2. It causes hypoxemia. And when there is a hypoxemia, there is a rise in the PACO2. And the peripheral and the central chemoreceptors are stimulated patient tries to uh, optimize the PCO2 by hyperventilating. So what you get is finally a reduction in the PCO2 and a respiratory alkalosis on the ABG. And uh, right now we are in the COVID uh, pandemic. Right. What are the ventilation perfusion uh, mismatch in these COVID patients? Yeah, In COVID patients, the main problem they have found is it is a thrombotic phase. So perfusion is affected. There's a lot of shunt areas taking place in the lung. That is why they have uh, uh, propagated that we should put the patient in the prone position because these patients go in for ARDS. And if you have to improve the saturation of the patient, you have to improve the posterior part of the lung, the ventilation at the posterior part of the lung. So they have found that non-invasive ventilation with the patient in the prone position is best for uh, COVID patients. Radharshan, sir, any, any other? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you. I am hearing you. Carry on, carry on. Uh, Dr. Belgitz, do you like to make any questions? Well, uh, no questions. I would like to compliment both the speakers' uh, excellent presentations. Uh, they try to make the, uh, you know, it's, it's a very complex, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, because of a lot of laws of physics which are involved. And uh, Dr. Pankaj Kundra, first, I mean, it was such a simplest, simple way of uh, uh, making the students understand. We have been teaching uh, all this uh, physiology of respiration, you know, for the last many years. But I think I enjoyed listening to his talk. It was uh, excellent. And of course, Dr. Shobha Philip also did a good job, very good job by various yeah. diagnoses to make the students understand and uh, my compliments to both uh, speakers. Excellent talks. Thank you, sir. Dr. Jayashree, any comments, please? Uh, same thing for Dr. Shobha. It was uh, the basics of the lectures today were so clear. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shobha. And uh, I think... <laughs> The matter has been explained so well in such simple words that it has definitely benefited the students, I'm sure. And uh, even if they have any queries, of course, they can ask later on. But excellent lectures and we thoroughly enjoyed them. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Shofa. Thank you, Dr. Vijesh. Thank uh, you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanish. We will sign off now and we hope to meet next week, same day, on the same morning. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody.